do some shifting. Let, let me start by thanking all of you for the work that you do, for getting together on a cold, snowy night. As a kid who grew up in Dan County, my mom was real active in the Dan County Democratic Party. So like you, I know what it's like to try to put frozen signs into the permafrost, okay? I know what it's like to knock on doors and you're afraid if someone's gonna answer, if they might be mean. I know what it's like to make a lot of phone calls. I used to lick a lot of envelopes and a lot of stamps back before they were sticky. Uh, most of all, I know, like you do, which pens do not freeze in the dead of winter. Um, thanks for the work that you do. You know what I know, that elections in this state, whether they are local, or regional, or statewide, or national, are won on the margins. The last Supreme Court race we had was won by less than 6,000 votes. It's less, that's 89 votes per county. They're won on the margins. And they are won because people like you are willing to sacrifice your time and your energy to get people to get to the polls, get people to vote, to educate people, and to come together on evenings like this to, to listen to candidates. And this truly is what democracy looks like. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Jill Karofsky, and I am a judge, and I'm running for the Supreme Court. I'm running because we gotta get this court back on track. I have spent the past several months traveling all around Wisconsin, and I hear the same thing from voters. They see justices on the Supreme Court who ignore the, the rule of law. They see justices on the Supreme Court who make decisions before anyone walks into the state Supreme Court chamber. They see justices on the court who are acting like politicians. And people are saying to me, this feels like corruption. And it is corruption. And if you think about, you talked about the importance of our Supreme Court, let's think about the cases that the court's gonna hear in the next few years. For sure, sure as I'm standing here, they are certainly gonna hear a case about redistricting. Right, we're gonna have a census next year. One of the first cases in 2021 is gonna be a gerrymandering case. I believe they are very likely to hear cases about women's access to health care. They will hear cases about how we're gonna keep our air clean, how we're gonna keep our water clean. What are, what's Wisconsin's approach gonna to be to gun violence? What's our approach gonna to be to the climate crisis? What is our democracy going to look like? criminal justice reform. All of those issues are very likely to end up on the doorstep of the Supreme Court in the next several years. So what I am offering in this race is a very, very clear choice. On the one hand, you have a guy named Dan Kelly. Dan Kelly serves on the court now. He was appointed by Scott Walker in 2016. He was Scott Walker's last appointee on the court. And Scott Walker appointed Dan Kelly onto the Supreme Court even though Dan Kelly had no prior judicial experience. But th that didn't matter to, to Scott Walker, right? Because Scott Walker wanted one thing and one thing only in justice. He wanted someone who would carry the water of the wealthy, who would carry the water of corporations, and who would carry the water of the outside special interests who worked very, very hard to de get Dan Kelly on the court. And Dan Kelly has done exactly what he was put on the court to do. He has not spilled a drop of their water. And he has not followed the rule of law along the way. I'm in this race and I'm offering three things. I'm gonna bring three things to this race and I'm gonna bring three things to the Supreme Court. First is my experience. Second are my values, my Wisconsin values. And the third thing is my energy. So as far as my experience, I'm the only one in this race who is or who has ever been a sitting trial court judge. I heard 1,700 cases last year. I know what it's like. I see how the law impacts real people. I know how important it is to follow the rule of law. I know that when I am interpreting the law and the Constitution, I need to do it with today in mind because it's 2019, almost 2020. I have been a prosecutor. I know how to be smart on crime. I understand how important it is to protect the rights of individuals, of defendants, and of witnesses, and of victims, and of people in our community. I've also been a victim advocate. I was the state's first violence against women resource prosecutor, and I was the head of the Office of Crime Victim Services at the Wisconsin Department of Justice. I traveled to every county in the state to make sure that crime victims had the services that they needed and were protected as their case was winding its way through the criminal justice system. So that's the experience that I will bring to the court. The second thing I'm gonna bring are my values. Born and raised in Wisconsin. I grew up in Middleton, just outside of Madison. 
And yes, while I was growing up, my mom was mayor of Middle Lake. And I watched my mom do, do a couple, a lot of really cool things. She brought emergency medical service to our town. She bought, brought buses in so folks had access to public transportation. And I was so proud of my mom that the first time I walked into a courtroom, I was only 10 years old, I went into a courtroom, I changed my middle name to be named after her. <laughs> and my, my dad was a local pediatrician. And after my dad retired, he opened up a free clinic for teenagers who didn't have access to health care in any other way. So my parents taught me the importance of public service. They taught me the importance of looking out for people in my community. They taught me the importance of standing up and leaning in if I had gifts that could help other people. And now, I'm the head of my own house. I am the single mom of two teenagers. And I talk to my kids about the importance of workers' rights, and human rights, and civil rights, and workers' rights. And when I told my kids that I was gonna run, I was thinking about running for the Supreme Court, I asked them what they thought. And they said, look, mom, we're concerned about gun violence. We're tired of going to school for these cold red drills. We don't want to know how to sit on the back of a toilet when an active shooter comes into a bathroom. We're going to school to learn. And we're concerned about the climate crisis. And we're concerned about the corruption that we see at the state and the federal level. And we want the grown-ups to figure out how to change these things, how to fix these things. We owe that to them. Those are the values I bring to the race. The values I got from my parents, the values I passed on to my kids, and the values that my kids have imparted right back to me. The third thing I'm bringing to this is my energy. I was a state high school tennis champion. I was a division one athlete in track and cross country. Uh, I finished the Ironman triathlon two times. I now run 50 mile ultra marathons. I ran an ultra marathon in August, the beginning of August. It started in Belleville. I ran south of Monroe and back to Belleville one day, 11 hours and, and 22 minutes. Uh, last month, we did a campaign swing up in Ashland. I got up on Saturday morning. I ran the entire Whistle Stop Marathon, 26.2 miles. Then we started our campaigning for the weekend. We put oh, almost 800 miles on my car. And the next Monday, I woke up and I was back in the courtroom at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. I'm telling you this for one reason and one reason only. I have never, ever been outworked or out hustled. And there is no way that Dan Kelly is going to outwork or out hustle me in this race. So let me tell you how things are looking for us. We've got some amazing endorsements, and some we've just gotten in the past several, a couple of weeks. We've seen some great momentum. Justice Rebecca Dallard is endorsing. The last three Democratic governors are endorsing. Uh, governors Doyle, Schreiber, and Earl. We have uh, the endorsement of 25, I think, actually I didn't count the numbers, but just over two dozen uh, Democratic legislators. The numbers ch uh, just changed in the last couple of days. We have, I have bipartisan support from sheriffs and from DAs and from judges from all over the state. More important than all of that though, we have had almost 1,200 people, 1,200 individuals contribute to our campaign. So we are truly growing a grassroots campaign. I want to leave you with three dates. The first date is this, it's February 18th. February 18th is the primary in this race. And there are some people who are saying, look, I'm gonna wait till after the primary to get involved, okay? I worry that that is gonna to be too little, too late. It, it's really compressed. The time between the primary in this race and the general election is only six weeks. And if people wait to get involved, we are giving Dan Kelly exactly what Dan Kelly wants, and that is an eight to nine month head start. We can't afford to do that. So I'm asking people to make a decision and make a decision now. I think that I am the most electable person in this race. I think I am the person who has the best chance going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dan Kelly in the general election. And I'm asking you not to wait. The second date is this, April 7th. April 7th is the general election date in this race, in the Supreme Court race. It's also the primary in the presidential race. So voter turnout should be high. But we still have our work cut out for us because we need to make sure that people vote all the way down the ballot. The ballot's going to be confusing, right? It's going to be partisan. It's going to be nonpartisan. There will be a lot of people on the ballot. Um, even, even if the number of Democrats is fewer than what it's now, there's still going to be, there's going to be a Democratic and Republican and Green Party. And there's going to be a lot to get to yeah. before you get to the Supreme Court race. So we have a lot of work that we need to do, even though voter turnout should be high. The third date I want to give you is this. 
We already talked about it. It's 2023. We are not going to have a chance to elect another state Supreme Court justice until 2023. 2020 is our chance to get your seat back on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. We cannot afford to have Dan Kelly on that court until 2030. So my promise to you is this. I am going to run like crazy between now and April 7th. Please join me. I've given you all a piece of our literature. Our website is jillforjustice.com. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We're on Instagram because my kids insisted on it. I don't know how to get on it, but I'm told that we're on it because I hear from them that it's going well. <laughs> um, please join us. Um, we have got to take this seat back. So thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end where I started, and that is thanking you for the work that you are doing. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for having me here tonight. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Your turn. <clears throat> questions? Comments? Yes. Uh, let's see. Are you in agreement that, um, I mean, President Trump is saying one of the keys for him in Wisconsin is whether or not the farmers, the rural people, uh, will vote for him again. Do you see the... Um, any changes in the rural farm population in Wisconsin that they're gonna, this time they're really gonna get out and vote Democrat? So, look, what we are doing is running a statewide campaign. We are gonna get everywhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so there are, there are we're, we're getting in the rural areas, we're getting, I mean, I have been to, I've been up to Ashland, mm -hmm. I've been to Merrill, I've been to Eau Claire and La Crosse, I've been to Shawano County, I've been to Door County, I've been to Wapaka, Racine, Kenosha, I mean, I could go on and on and on. We're going to get everywhere, and we're going to talk to as many people as we possibly can, and we're going to do everything we can to get our message out to people. Um, I think one of the points you made is, is huge, and that we, we need to energize people. We need to inspire people, which is why I'm working so hard to get out and to talk to as many people as I can to inspire them about this race and get them to get out and vote. We did it at the last election. We, and, the, the, and Becky Dallas. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the, la the last state, well, yeah, Tony Evers, right. Wide. Tony and Evers, Mandela Barnes, exactly. Sarah Godlewski, Josh Call, and um, uh, LaFollette, Doug LaFollette, yeah. right. All five statewide constitutional officers. It was amazing. And we did it in 2018 with Justice Dallet. We can do it. I've hired Justice Dallet's team to run my campaign. I have her mm -hmm. campaign manager. Mm -hmm. I also hired her pollster, um, okay. and I talk to her often. She's been very, very helpful. Both she and Lisa Neubauer have been incredibly helpful and supportive. What's the, what's the makeup like on the uh, Supreme Court now? There's uh, with the uh, Walker appointee and the... So there's five conservatives on the court and, yeah, and two liberals. Five. Yep. Yeah. So replacing one of the conservatives would make it a 4-3. It would make it 4-3, right. And then you need to, look, Becky Dallet is a, is a wonderful consensus builder. I've been a really strong consensus builder my whole career. And I think that the two of us have a really, really, we've got a shot at changing people's mm -hmm. minds if we are up there together. The only thing, changing one person's mind is a lot easier than trying to change two people's minds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Think about when you try to change your parents' minds about who could go out and eat. You usually get one of them, but not both of them. Oh, I just read this book uh, by Ann Nelson, um, A-N-N-E Nelson. It was called uh, Media, Money, and the Secret Hub of the Radical Right. And it was just, you know, all these groups that they got, um, you know, uh, evan evangelical. And they had the control of the media, you know, all these radio stations. It is in Wisconsin, Bill Moore, I think he's here, Bridges. And anyways, um, well, I got two questions. Um, like, if, does the state Supreme Court, um, like, um, establish or get started for the nonprofit, you know, if a company is really a truly a nonprofit, or is that always just a fence, or how does it start in the lower court? You know, if somebody's, you know, using their money, if they're supposed to be a, non a tax exempt group, you know, a, a tax exempt, and that, but they're not, you know, they're advocating for candidacy. Um, I don't know, does that start small or? Well, oh, I see what you're saying. Like yeah. the, the out, the out, the independent expenditure money. Yeah, yeah. Do they get involved in these races? Is that your question? Well, yeah, no, I mean they do, but then how do they 
you get them to lose their tax exempt. You know, sometimes you'll see some company, uh, some group will lose it and then they get it back. You know, yeah, and I, I don't know the answer yeah, to that question. Right. I think someone would have to come in. I don't know if it's that someone, you know, tells on them or files a complaint or something like that. Okay. And then when I was reading that book, they had a lot of <coughs> church groups, how when they get the church list and uh, they can, you know, vote or from that. It'll sure, and I think that that, uh, there, I think that that absolutely happened in the last Supreme Court case, uh, yeah. excuse me, election. Yeah, it's like, how can you reach the church and then they are offset that? That's a challenge, I bet. It, um, we just gotta, get, look, we have numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have the numbers. We always have the numbers. We just got to get them out to vote. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, they get involved in, uh, I mean, now they're arguing or bickering over whether to call a Christmas tree a Christmas tree or a holiday tree. I, the point I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, I read a lot, and uh, when I've been reading, I usually say to myself, are there any adults in the room? <laughs> yeah, there are huge issues in the state. I mean, we've talked about them: gun violence, climate change. We have two farms that are closing every day in the state, and right, they're choosing to to use our taxpayer dollars to debate about whether or not a Christmas tree is a Christmas tree. Isn't the women's vote uh, going to be pretty crucial in Wisconsin and elsewhere in these elections? Or I think everyone's vote is going to be crucial. Yeah. Every, look, these races are run on the margins. We need to get people in the rural areas out. We need to get women out. We need to get people in college age kids out. Yes. We really need to energize them. We're gonna have a couple events in, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison next week to try to energize um, kids over in both uh, undergrad and law school over there. Yeah, it's all gonna matter. The last race was won by less than 6,000 votes. Well, it seems to me I heard the last election some say part of the problem was the African American vote in Milwaukee not coming out with so many strong. Again, I, you know, so I think this, uh, uh, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know that. The last one, yeah, where they lost, where, where the liberal lost. In the, the Lisa Neubauer race. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that they, um, Brian Hagedorn was able to get two hundred thousand more people to the polls than Mike Spinak had the year before. Um, I think as far as the Milwaukee vote is concerned that for this race, they're going to have a contested mayoral race and they're going to have a contested county exec race in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So I am hoping that people in Milwaukee are going to come out and vote. But again, they got to vote on, you know, on, on every single part of the ballot. Yeah. How do you get 1,700 churches? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I get five new. I basically get five new cases a day. So they don't all go to trial, and people plead out. But it is a. I am in the courtroom a lot. I am in the courtroom a lot. Um, people plead, and I need to be there. I've got. A, I'll have a week long sexual assault trial next week, and I have a week long attempted homicide trial in December. And um, I, you know, the the point is the point I was trying to make is that I see so many people in my courtroom and you cannot help but be touched by the humanity and the, the impact that the law has on real people. I mean, I see people who are struggling with um, alcohol addictions and opioid addictions and people who, you know, kids who have been victims of child abuse and sexual abuse and I have, you know, I have families in there whose loved ones have been killed by someone else and it's, it's, oh, it's sad sometimes. I mean, sometimes you're uplifted because someone has has had the resilience, and I had coffee a couple of weeks ago with a woman I had helped when I was at the Department of Justice. She was an adolescent sexual assault victim, and she is about to graduate from the City of Madison Police Department Academy, and she's gonna be a police officer. So it's also sometimes really uplifting, mm -hmm. but I am struck every day by how this is so impactful on real people, how the law is impactful. It's not this esoteric concept that's way up here. It's right here. <laughs> it's high. It's so in the so I'm on the criminal rotation. We have 17 judges in Dane County. There are six of us who handle all the criminal cases. Uh, there are four who handle the juvenile cases, and the seven uh, rest of the seven handle the civil cases. We could have we have the capacity to have one of the civil or juvenile judges hear the criminal cases. The problem is we don't have enough DAs or public defenders to get to the courtroom on time. Mm. 
we would just be spreading them. They'd have to go to one more courtroom mm -hmm. in the courthouse and it spreads them too thin, so they have asked us to stay like it is. So I have two and a half time the caseloads of my colleagues who are in the civil rotation. Mm -hmm. It's very high. It's not that way all over the state. No, no, it's very, but it is very high. The first step to getting rid of Kelly is winning the primary. Yep. Would you toot your own horn, please, and tell us how mm -hmm. much superior you are to the opponent running against you? Sure. So the primary is three-way, right? Mm -hmm. And right. The, the top two will go forward. So I think you're asking me about Professor Flone, And I'll just say yes. um, I like Professor Flone. I see him all the time. Um, and he is, a, he is a nice man. And he ran in 2013. Yes. And he lost by quite a bit. He's he's never won an election. Um, I ran for my my seat in Dane County, and I won by 17 points. And it really it seemed like a tough race at the time, but I ended up winning by a lot. Um, I am a sitting judge. Professor Flown has never been a judge. Voters in Wisconsin look to judges when they are voting for Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I have been a prosecutor. Uh, voters in Wisconsin look to prosecutors when they're voting for Supreme. Court. I'm also a woman, and not to state the obvious, but I always feel funny, a little funny saying that. Um, I think tw I think in 2020, that's gonna be important. I think that being a woman in 2020 is going to be a real, real plus. Uh, I am the single mother of two teenagers, so I am tough as hell. <laughs> okay. um, we've also been running, a, we've also got a strong campaign going, and, and um, a, um, our markers are higher than his are. We have twice as many people who have contributed We've raised twice as many, uh, twice as much money as he has. We have over, I think we have um, 150 um, electeds endorsing us from all parts of government from around the state, from all over the state. I think he only has seven people outside of the Milwaukee area. Okay, so I think for all of those, we gotta think about who is the most electable person? Who, who's gonna sit up in a debate with Dan Kelly and just, Go toe to toe with that guy, right? I'm ready to do that. Very important. It is and, very. It is in very the, important. The, in this last uh, Supreme Court uh, debate series, uh, the uh, uh, the lady was uh, Lisa Neubauer. Yes. Very. She was very repetitive. She would. She had certain things she would say, and and then. Next time around, she'd say the same thing again. And she was not uh, nearly as uh, flexible in her answers as, as the, the guy was. So I have the great advantage. And I think that was a, uh, I was very disappointed. Yeah. And, with how, and I think with other, how those other people were. Debates went. Yeah. I think, you know, I have the great advantage of batting third behind two great women, Becky Dallet and Lisa Neubauer. So mm -hmm. I've got to see the pitches coming in. From the, for the first mm -hmm. two batters. And what you, there are lessons to be learned from, from their races. Becky Dallet yes. always led with the fact that she was a sitting trial court judge. Becky Dallet always led with the fact that she had been a former prosecutor. Becky Dallet left with her value, led with her values, like, like mm -hmm. I did tonight in my speech and like yes. I do in every single speech that I give. I think those are a lot of the lessons to be learned from those two races. Yeah. And it's why, as I mentioned, I hired Becky Dallet's team to, to run right. our race. And we can we can assume that in the primary, uh, Kelly is going to be one of the of the two that uh, that win. It would be yeah. nice if he didn't. Yeah. But, I, uh, I don't see how that. I just don't see how that does will. not happen. Yeah, that, I, I think that's going to happen. And so yeah. we want to make very sure you're the other one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. That's my job. Right. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, I, I saw Becky Dallet when the, there was a real big event in the scene. It was, I think, by the lake, and the Bernie was there, and, the, and the, I don't know, a bunch of candidates spoke. And then Becky Dallet walked right down the thing, shaking hands. I got to shake her hand. I thought, well, that made a good impression. It was, you know, there were probably, I don't know, 2,000 people in that room, and, you know, she passed them out her own things. You know? Yeah. That well, I, th good. I think that with the presidential candidates coming in, I mean, they'll be here. Um, in in February and in March for certain, and which will be great because we'll get to I'll get to go to their events and it'll be part of that. So you're, I completely completely agree. Yeah. 
do you see in the uh, criminal justice department that he's changed from the most uh, publicized thing I can think of is the juvenile detention center in Lincoln House. Oh, Lincoln House. Yeah, mm -hmm. Lincoln House. Yeah, and they are changing that. It's taking a little longer um, than they than is they thought. That, did the Supreme Court affect any of that stuff, or is that? It's it's statewide. That's it's in the Department of Corrections. That's where it's that's they're in charge of of Lincoln Hills and the juvenile correction. I mean, look, if, as far as the issues that I see in the criminal justice system is, we have a mass incarceration problem in the state. We have twenty Absolutely. over twenty three thousand people who are incarcerated in the state. We have I think four times as many people incarcerated in the state as they do in the state of Minnesota per prisoner in this state. Um, I think to keep I think per we spend we spend more on our Department of Corrections than we do our Department of uh, excuse me education. We spend more locking people up than we do teaching our kids. Um, I think that the um, opioid crisis is is huge. I think that the racial disparities in the criminal justice <coughs> system are huge. And I think that there are things that Supreme Court justices can do besides just make decision in cases. I think you get to you know when you're a state <coughs> Supreme Court justice and you give a speech about something, people listen to you. And I think that you know you take issues and you and you they become the issues that you want to talk about and you do that. Justice Dallet has absolutely done that. She talks a lot about mass incarceration. She talks a lot about racial disparity. With with the kind of divided government we have, with the two the two houses of the legislature being Republican and the governor being Democrat, that that causes. Uh, uh, between uh, Evers and uh, Call, uh, you know they're on one side, and and the two uh, houses of the legislature, due to gerrymandering, are on the other side, and uh, so that's bound to cause the kind of conflicts that will that will bring more things to the Supreme Court. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Do you have a question back there? I was reading. Um, Somebody from Wisdom, and they were saying that the Green Bay prison isn't going to be useful anymore because it's not up to snuff. We have some really old prisons in this state. Um, so, as a judge, you're, we go on prison tours every term, and I went to a prison mm -hmm. tour this last term to, at Columbia. Um, Wapun's very, very old. The Green Bay is very old. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have some very, very antiquated prisons. So, he prisons. was saying instead of building new prisons to replace Green Bay, it's an opportunity to do some reforms so that we have less people. Yeah, we have lots of opportunities. The legislature has lots and lots of opportunities to enact some reforms. Absolutely. Do you think there's a real need to have any more prisons? I agree. The issue with the people who went in under the old law where the sentences didn't really mean, you know, well, right, and they weren't getting they weren't getting paroled at all during the time that Scott Walker was governor. Now Tony Evers has come in, and the parole board is working again, and he's even pardoning people. Scott Walker didn't pardon a single person yeah. in eight years. Okay. So you have people who are very, very elderly in prison who are infirm, and they can't get out. And then we're and we're putting the bill for it. Yeah. Is it true that uh, Republicans? Uh, they want more and more people in prison because they jump for joy because they think that these people are not going to be able to vote. Democrats, is there any truth to that? I, and I, agree. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that for a long time. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, in your role as a judge and as a victim advocate, what draws you to me to you think should be changed? You know, I always as it, I always have a problem with the laws that don't allow people to have, like, judges to have discretion, so laws where there's a mandatory minimum sentence. Right. Um, yeah. I feel like I'm elected by the voters in my community because of my judgment, and I have shown that I am able to use my discretion in a responsible way, and I think that uh, each case is so individual, and every person in front of you is so individual, you really, mm -hmm. you know, it ties your hands of maybe imposing a smarter sentence than you would be able to otherwise. That's another thing that uh, changes the population in prison is that minimum sentence. Of sure. Yeah, absolutely. Over incarceration. Mm -hmm. 
my wife and I are not as upset as we were as time has passed. We've kind of gotten over it, but we're, we can still get upset for the fact that Mrs. Clinton didn't visit Wisconsin like she should have. If she had visited here, maybe uh, she would have uh, won the state. And I've talked to some of my other friends who feel the same way. They're still kind of upset. I know I am. I, I've gotten over it quite a bit, but I got about 25% of it still hanging around. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> haven't there been issues of uh, conflict of interest and even yes. even the recused around the Supreme Court? Can you remind us of some of those and how you can something be done to change? Yeah, absolutely. So, right, there aren't recusal rules. So there can be groups that can, um, for instance, um, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. Uh, Dan Kelly worked for that organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, before a recent decision that he came out with in June, uh, the Wisconsin Institute of Law and Liberty gave money to his campaign. He ruled in their favor, and then they gave him more money afterwards. Then there's no rule, there's, there's nothing that says that he can't do that. Now the justices on the Supreme Court had an opportunity to draft a rule. And there were, there were some reserve judges that asked them to consider a specific rule. And they wouldn't even have a hearing on that rule. They wouldn't even just get together and mm -hmm. talk about it. So yes, they should get together and they should talk about what the rule is. And then they should draft a rule. And then everyone should follow that rule. Yeah, and that's corruption at its core. Yeah, it's corruption, the very definition. And it undermines people's confidence in the court, undermines people's confidence in the, in the entire judicial system. And it's, it's troubling. Do you have endorsements from the uh, uh, representative and senator for this area? Uh, yes. Uh, Janice um, Ringhand and Mark Spreitzer? State senator. Yes, I want to say I, yes, yes, Deb, for sure. I want to say yes. Um, I have such a big spreadsheet, and I'm, a, I'm afraid to say, but I wouldn't say yes publicly without That's checking. Right. Here, here it's, it's I can check if I get on my phone. Yeah, Deb, it, Deb is for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I'm pretty Mark's sure Mark is. is yep, I'm pretty sure Mark is, area. and I'm pretty sure that um, Janice Trans is too. Training. Yeah, but I, before, before reason, anyone ever, I always check. The reason I ask is, uh, do I need to go, uh, no, uh, knock on their door to, to make sure. I think that they are all on board, and I, can, okay. I but I will check before I leave. Good. Just, I, I want to be I want to be careful, especially in a public setting. The last thing I want sure. is someone to say, I you I I haven't endorsed you. You said I did, so I'm just being very careful. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, anyone that you are able to to talk to would be great. Mm -hmm. If I need to, I will. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll check on my. I can get on our. our I can get on the. Uh, campaign spreadsheet. Right. If people want to plug in, not that you're endorsing, but if people want to plug into your campaign, uh, is there any chance yeah. that they can? Yeah, so um, getting on our Facebook, I don't know if you do Facebook, getting on our Facebook page and liking our page and letting your friends know that you like our page would be great. Getting on our website, jillforjustice.com, there are things you can sign up, like I want to sign or I'll help okay. pass out nom nomination papers or all that kind of stuff. There's a place where you can, a box that you can mark there. Letting people know, forwarding our, um, our website onto all your friends would be great. Making sure people get out and vote, obviously closer election. Um, we're hopefully gonna have yard signs at the beginning of next month, I'm hoping, the beginning of December. Mm -hmm. so, you have any thoughts on the impeachment process? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it goes back to the whole reason I'm running for the state Supreme Court. Is that when when you when we see corruption, we need to do something about it. We just yeah. can't look the other way. We need to yeah. do something about it. We all need to do something about it. What, whatever it is we're able to do, we need to do it. Yeah, I, I guess that's my feeling. It's like when Democrats say, "Oh, well, it hurt us in the election." It's like that isn't. That's the point. not the, the point. point. Yeah, our, that our, shouldn't our, be the point. <laughs> I I truly believe our democracy is at stake. Um, and I, 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 you know, I say this to my kids, I'm doing this because of you and for you, and I couldn't do it without you. Um, but I'm worried about this state for, for the future generations. And we all should be, and our country.
Rangers had two different bills they were going to pass for gun reform, and that they went to Fitzgerald, gaveled in, and then and he called the special session. Robin Voss did the exact same thing. Okay, so is the the next step now for this to go to the Supreme Court, or how does you know like some of the things you've mentioned, like gerrymandering and climate change, and that, is how do they then go to the Supreme? Court? Well, gerrymandering gerrymandering is probably going to go to the Supreme Court because the legislature is going to draw a line. I mean, one way that I think mm -hmm. it has a good chance is the legislature is going to draw lines, and Tony Evers is going to change the lines or veto them or something, in that case, it's going to get to the Supreme Court. Now, there are lots of other ways that that could get to the Supreme Court. You could have them drawn and Tony Evers could sign off on them. I, I find that hard to believe. Someone else could sue, right? And that's, that's what happened. That's how the Whitford suit got to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court made it really clear at the end of the last session in June that if it's a gerrymandering case based on partisanship, they're not going to hear it. It goes to the state Supreme Court. Right. Um, other issues that, that would go is they'd have to pass a law and someone would have to say that the law is, is violating their rights, is not constitutional, and, and the lawsuit would have, to be, would have to be brought. As far as there being no law, um, you can't, I, I, I've never heard of a lawsuit that was brought because the legislature didn't act on something. You know, the legislature kind of has, has tied the governor's hands on, on that for the time being. Well, like I said, that I just saw the U.S. Supreme Court st said they can now sue uh, Remington in Connecticut or something. Does that would that apply to Wisconsin? I don't. I'd have to do some research. There was yeah. some some law. They it, it was the the Connecticut just passed it on and then it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Maybe they just ruled yesterday, so they can uh, for gun. It was a. Uh, the Sandy Hook, yeah. Yeah, the families wanted to sue Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it would apply here if the U.S. Supreme Court passed it, but it depends But I mean, on it, 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 because of the Connecticut had a certain law, they based it on that. Right, I think, they, I think they passed it, I think the Connecticut law. passed legislation afterwards, right? And I don't, to my knowledge, we don't have that on the books here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I, I really, really appreciate it. I'm gonna check those names for you. Um, thank you, thanks for having me and I would love to have your support. Thank you.